We all know that bees are super important, but did you know that bumblebees are endangered and that you can help scientists uh, figure out what bumblebees are your, in your area? Find out in today's episode, Project Bumblebee, starting right now. Zzz. Welcome to the Weird and Wacky Planet's Nature Just Got Real podcast for kids. Join KB Carr, author of the Weird and Wacky Planet series with Chuck Darwin, Tito and Captain Jack as they bring you the real skinny on what's really going on in the natural world. And now, here's your host, KB Carr. Hello, hello, hello. This is KB Carr again, and today we have with us uh, Rich Hatfield. And how do you say the society that you're from? What, Xerxes? Yeah, the Xerxes Society. Exactly. Yeah, pretty sure I should have asked you that first. <laughs> we like to wing it here. <laughs> okay, sure. great. All right, and he's going to talk to us today about something called uh, Bumblebee Watch, which I'm particularly excited about, and I will tell you that why in a minute. Um, so, Rich, can you tell us about you, what you do, and then what is Bumblebee Watch? Yeah, uh, so my name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist for the Xerxes Society. Um, and I, at this point, direct our conservation, our bumblebee conservation program. Um, and that can mean a whole host of things from doing direct field research to um, doing advocacy to doing education. So I, I kind of run the gamut as far as that goes, wearing many different hats on uh, any given day. Um, but largely it means, you know, tracking bumblebee populations, trying to advocate for species that need attention. All right, so and so you're tracking uh, bumblebee populations, and why is it important to document uh, bumblebees? Why is that? Why is that important today? Well, um, you know, there are a, a lot of people on the planet, and uh, those people need to eat, and in the process of needing to eat, we need to grow a lot of food. So we use a lot of land um, for crops, um, and about one out of three bites of food that we get from those crops only exists because a bee pollinated that plant. And sometimes that bee is a honeybee, but oftentimes it's not a honeybee. There are other pollinators that, that pollinate those crops. And bumblebees are, are the, the best native bee for pollination services, especially for things like tomatoes and eggplants um, and apples and a lot of other early blooming plants like blueberries, um, you know, bumblebees are very important pollinators. And in addition to, to humans sort of taking up a lot of space growing food, we've done a lot of things to the environment over the last, you know, 50 to 100 years that have really changed it. And in some cases made it difficult for bumblebees to thrive as much as they once did. And um, all of those situations mean that we need to do a better job of, of tracking our native pollinators and finding out what populations are doing well and which ones aren't, and then using that information to help us learn what we can do to make the situation better. Agreed, agreed. And, uh, and, and so are, are all bumblebees endangered? No, um, not to the best of our knowledge anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm actually the this is gonna sound complicated and it, it's really just a big long title and a word that doesn't mean all that much. But I'm, I'm the red list authority for the IUCN Bumblebee Specialist Group. And what that means is awesome. one of my jobs is to assess the extinction risk of all of the bumblebees um, in the world. And there's about 250 different species of them. And we've so far assessed the Americas, so the New World, um, North America, Central America, South America. And what we've learned is, is, is about a quarter of the species are facing some degree of extinction risk, some of them more so than others. Um, but three quarters of them seem to be doing, you know, relatively fine compared with their baseline levels. Um, and here in the United States, we have um, one species, or actually 
yeah, we have one species that's formally listed as an endangered species, and that's the rusty patch bumblebee, which is native in the eastern part of the United States. And then just recently, the Fish and Wildlife Service has added or, or proposed to add a second species to that list, which is Franklin's bumblebee, which is native in a really small area of southern Oregon and northern California. And there are a few other species that have been petitioned for sort of official endangered species status in the United States. But there's only two species that have official endangered status currently. Um, but there are several more species than that that have imperiled populations and potentially warrant endangered species status, but not, don't necessarily have it from my sort of political perspective, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Um, and I'm very familiar with the, the, uh, the list. <laughs> In my <laughs> books, we rate all the animals where they're at according to that list, and, and that can change. But, uh, but yeah. yeah, we look at that a lot, a lot. So thank you for doing that. that that's important work. Very, yeah. Yeah. It is important work. It's yes, important it is. To, to sort of know trends of, of things. And, you know, one of the reasons that we need people to track bumblebees is because we just don't have, like for mammals, um, like elephants and giraffes and all these charismatic megafauna, it's pretty easy to track their populations because it's hard to, or I mean, it's easy to see them and count them. <laughs> yeah, on account of they're big. <laughs> yeah, they're big. <laughs> pay attention to them, you know, but with bumblebees, you know, they're tiny and, um, and, and very undetectable in many cases. So we don't have like baseline information about what a healthy population is. And so we're still trying to just get baseline information on, on a lot of these animals, which is why it's so important for people to go out and, and, and track them. Because I, I'm one person, I can't handle North America by myself. By I need, yourself? I don't know why yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I could. It would just take, it would take, take a really years. long time. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Yeah, I don't have that kind of time, unfortunately. So I need help. And that, that's why we launched Bumblebee Watch, was that was, to, you know, I, my sense of working with people over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years on this issue is that people really want to help. They want to do the right thing and don't know how. And so right. one of the things that we were hoping to do with Bumblebee Watch is give people a channel where they can help and actually really contribute to conservation science. And I think that's one of the great parts about, about it. Yeah, we talk about uh, citizen science a lot here, um, about what normal people can do to contribute to the data that scientists are, are uh, collecting. So, um, yeah. and one of the reasons I'm really excited about this one is that I do, or I have had in our building, a colony of bumblebees kind of in one of our overhangs. Okay. <laughs> I see them uh, every year so far for the last about three or four years. Cool. Um, and my sister owns the building, so I'm like, don't do anything with that overhead. <laughs> don't touch that. <laughs> so this year I got a trail working. cam, right, right. Like no exterminators. I want to, don't touch those bees. And yeah. so, uh, and so I got a trail cam. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that up this year and see what I see. And I'm gonna oh. see if I can get some good close up pictures for you. So, so right. say I do uh, do that. And so walk me through the process of what I, or anyone else who's listening, um, what kids can do to start to document that. How does, what does that look like? What would we do? Yeah, I mean, assuming you already have a picture, you, you know, the process is pretty easy. Assuming you don't have a picture yet, you know, it can become an adventure, right? It's like, uh, it's yeah. like Pokemon yeah. Go, but for real animals. And so <laughs> go out into your backyard and start looking at flowers and trying to find bumblebees. And <laughs> picture of a well, bumblebee. they're not as fast as some insects, so that's, so that's right. a plus. <laughs> yeah. That's a plus. Go, go, that's right. That's right. They're not as fast. So that, mm -hmm. that's part of the challenge is trying to get a good picture. And oftentimes we encourage people that really struggle, especially if you're trying to use a cell phone camera, just actually take a video of, of the animal and then oftentimes you can if you can figure out how to do it at least oh. take a in shot of the video and, and take then, your still from that yeah exactly and sometimes um videos are better at capturing of getting more things in focus and so 
yeah. Like, get a better photo that way. So that's that just makes a, a lot it's of good. sense, there actually. Yeah. A lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now I know what I'm doing. Oh, good. Right, <laughs> yeah. So, I, so that I've got my my photo, and I'm sure a kid is going to be able to extract a photo a lot easier than me. I'll have to get a kid to do it, but that's okay. <laughs> I have those. <laughs> You know, people. Yeah. <laughs> so once I have that, what am I doing with it? Yeah, there, there's, there's a couple of different options. One, if you know, if if you, if a kid is using their parent's smartphone or has access to an iPad or some kind of tablet, um, there we do have native apps for both the Android and iPhone um, or iOS platforms. So they could just download the native app. They're free. Um, okay. And you could just use the apps to to identify the the animal and then submit it to Bumblebee Watch, or they could take the camera and connect it to their computer, um, or just use the browser in a phone and go to bumblebeewatch.org. And the name of the apps are both Bumblebee Watch as well. So if you search in the App Store or Google Play Store or wherever you get your apps, you can find them. Right. Just typing in, in Bumblebee Watch. And then um, they would need an account. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, I, I probably should have, you said you like to do it on the fly. So I, I guess I'll do it on the fly too. But I don't know what our rules are in terms of age of having an account. It's probably best for someone that's younger to have their parents sign up for an, an adult account. Could, yeah, an adult could do it. Yeah. That's not a bad yeah. idea at all. Because I, yeah, yeah, I'd be more comfortable we'll need with an, that. Well. We'll need an email address. And I think you have to be, in most cases, 12 or 13 to have an email address. But maybe, anyway, I would encourage them to work with their parents to just set up an account. Um, and then they can go through the process of uploading a photo, um, which is pretty easy. You can just basically drag and drop it onto the screen and it will upload. Um, and then they need to know where they took the photo and the day on which they took the photo. So there's a little okay. map. You can use Google Maps and even type in your address and it'll zoom into your house and then you can click the actual location where where you took the photo and it'll enter the latitude and longitude automatically and then oh um, nice okay yeah yeah and then they enter the um the date that they took it um, from a calendar there and then sort of once they've entered all that that sort of logistical information it takes you to the next page if you're on the web app um and there's a little identification feature where it shows a photo and it helps you to try to identify the species that you That's think. cool. Yeah. yeah that's you, super cool. So you select, you know, does it have a yellow face or a black face? Do you see stripes on the abdomen mm -hmm. or red or yellow? And then once you've done that, and based on the location, it helps narrow down the choices or potential species that it could be. And then you select whatever species you think it is, or you can say, I don't know, it's I, I'm just a bumblebee, and submit it. And then it goes into a pool of sightings. Um, and we have a team of experts that log in and actually look at each photo and put a species name on it if we're able to. Um, that, then it's officially entered into the database as a verified sighting. It basically, oh, cool. You know, yeah. Who knows what I have living in my overhang? <laughs> I'm very excited to find out. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and I know that, um, there are other things that we can do to help bumblebees out, like in our in our own backyards and and stuff. What what are some things what, that that families can do um, that'll that'll kind of help bumblebees out? Yeah, bumblebees and pollinators in general really need three things. They need um, a safe place to overwinter and build their nest. Mm -hmm. They need food, so that usually comes in the form of of flowers. Bees only eat pollen and nectar. So you plant flowers and you're feeding bees and, and other pollinators. And then they need a pesticide and disease-free environment. And so yeah. um, we really need people in an ornamental setting to not be using chemicals. Um, there just isn't any need for it in a backyard setting. Um, Agreed. As we, as we start to take away native habitat, we need our gardens and backyards to be functional ecosystems and, and beyond pretty or, or sort of redefining what pretty is and pretty means you know plants that are crawling with all the insects that help make a functioning ecosystem so agreed yeah and, and weeds are people too that's right and weeds, <laughs> weeds 
your lawn matter like those (laughs) those early dandelions that pop up and daisies are sometimes some of the only flowers in the landscape and so leaving them there for some of our early emerging queens is is super important i am a huge dandelion fan very very (laughs) huge ask anyone (laughs) i've gotten in trouble because of that before but that's okay (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yep, I love dandelions. All right. So this is great information. And this is something kids and families can now do while we're quarantined. You know, spring's right. coming up and, and they're going to start to emerge. And so this is something that we can do at home. Uh, and we're going to need those kind of things for a while. So thank you yeah. so much for that. And I'll have all that information in the show notes too, the link to the app great. and to your website as well. Um, so, so if anybody's interested in doing that, um, I'll have those links in the show notes. And I do want to ask you just one more thing. What, what do you want kids to know most about, about this? I, I think what I want kids to know most about, um, not necessarily just this, but about just the world in general, is that you don't have to go to a national park or a national forest to see a whole host of wild animals. There is literally a wildlife safari happening in your, your next door park or your backyard or your garden right now. <laughs> and all you have to do is go out there and pay attention to what you see. And I guarantee that in the course of 15 minutes of looking around, I bet you can find 20 different species of animals that are all unique and beautiful and wonderful. And you know, if one of those- necessary. <laughs> and necessary, absolutely, yeah. Um, and and you know, if one of them happens to be a bumblebee, I, we would love it if you would snap a photo of it, and share share the observation with us. But the most important thing is to just get out there and observe the things around you and connect with those animals and and try to learn what each one of them is doing in your garden because they have a role and a, and a really important role at that. Agreed. Agreed. Rich, thank you so much for being on the show with us today and and teaching us about bumblebees and and what we can do to help uh, you guys collect data. Like I said, I'm super excited to get my trail cam up and we're going to see what we got going on there in the uh, in the overhang. I hope it's something really rare, but probably not. But still, (laughs) it's going to be exciting to see what it is. Probably not. (laughs) But it still will be exciting. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Ever spotted a flying monkey? What about the naked rodents who snack on the unthinkable? Or tiny elephants you can hold in your hands? Take a look at these animals and more in the book Weird and Wacky Creatures 2, part of the Weird and Wacky Planet series by KB Khan. Spot them wherever books are sold and wrap your trunk around your own copy. Hope you enjoyed that. I thought that was super interesting. I had no idea that there was more than one species of bumblebee. I thought bumblebee was a species of bee, but it turns out it's its own species and it has several other species of bumblebee. So I'm looking forward to figuring out what I have around my house. So I hope you get a chance to uh, to check that out too at your house. And now here is uh, Chuck Darwin with the word of the week. It's time for the Weird and Wacky Word of the Week. The Word of the Week is pollinator. A pollinator is an animal that moves or carries pollen to a plant, causing the seeds to be fertilized. Those animal pollinators can be bees, bats, birds, butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, wasps, or other small mammals. The word pollinator is a noun, and what those animals do is pollinate, and that is a verb. See how many times you can use the word pollinator as a noun and pollinate as a verb in a sentence today and impress someone with your genius. Until next week, I am Dr. Chuck Darwin. Cheerio. Thank you, Chuck. And now here's Captain Jack to answer another one of your questions. Got a question? Ask the captain. Ahoy, mateys. This week's question comes from Brandon in Fort Lauderdale. Brandon asks, can bumblebees sting you? Well, Brandon, the answer is yes. It's pretty rare, though, and they only do it if they're provoked. 
only female bumblebees have stingers, but it doesn't have a barb so it can sting you multiple times. Again, it's pretty rare for it to sting you at all, but if it's on its back, leave it alone. That's a defensive position, so don't bother it if you find one. If a bumblebee is flying near you, just stand still or back away slowly. It will go away once it figures out you aren't a flower. Mommy is always saying I'm sweet, so I will be keeping this in mind whenever I see any bumblebees from now on. Hope that answers your question, Brandon. If you want to ask me anything, just email it to naturejustgotreal at gmail.com. I'm always listening. I'd also like to clear something up from last week's episode. Tito found a picture of me wearing a mask. Mommy photoshopped a mask onto my picture, so I was never actually wearing a mask. Can you imagine Mommy trying to get a mask on me? Check your facts next time, Tito. Just saying. This is Captain Jack signing off until next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jack, for your contribution, as uh, as interesting as it usually is. Yeah, I think I'm going to dress you up as a bumblebee for Halloween. How would you like that, huh? I like it. And now here's Tito with the creature feature. Take it away, Tito. And now, the Weird and Wacky Weekly Creature Feature. This week's weird animal is the bumblebee, of course. What, not weird enough for you? Let's see if I can change your mind. Here's some bumblebee facts you may or may not be aware of. Bumblebees aren't just black and yellow. They can be orange with white stripes. There are over 300 different species of bumblebees worldwide. The world's largest bumblebee lives in South America, and the queen is almost 1.6 inches long. That's a big girl. Bumblebees have such a fast metabolism that they are only about 40 minutes away from starving, even with a full stomach, so they have to be continuously finding food. Bumblebees have been known to bite plants to make them produce flowers quicker when pollen is scarce, so they're like little bee farmers. Bumblebees have five eyes, but they can't see the color red. Is that all weird enough for you? I thought so. I'm Tito, and I'll see you all next week. I hope you enjoyed today's show and that you find out more about Project Bumblebee. I will put those links in the show notes so you can check them out. And uh, go have a bumblebee picture-taking adventure in your neighborhood. Thanks for listening. That wraps up the show for today. Thank you to our sponsor, Weird and Wacky Planet. And thank you for listening. Thank you for caring and thank you for sharing. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Let us know if you do and we might mention you on the show. Until next week, go have an adventure in your neighbourhood.